Let's look at a Chinese Dao. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I mostly talk about European and sometimes Indian weapons, but what I believe I've never talked about in the four years that I've been making videos on this channel are Chinese weapons. I may have touched on them in the past, but I, I've never actually really owned a Chinese, an antique Chinese weapon to show an example of, and now I have one. Um, as many of you know, I buy and sell antique swords to augment my own collection, and this came to me um, with some other stuff, and it is a 19th century, probably, in fact, almost certainly, it could even be early 20th century, actually. Um, I'll touch on why in a second, um, but let's say it's a 100-year-old, maybe 150-year-old, Chinese Dao. Now what is a Dao? Well first of all it's one of these. Um, so it's a single-edged sword. Some people might refer to it as a Chinese broadsword. I don't really like that term personally. Um, certainly in European and American circles a broadsword tends to be used for a double-edged basket hilted sword so I think it kind of confuses the issue. But I know in Chinese martial arts many people call it a Chinese broadsword because it is broader than the Jan, which is the straight double-edged sword. Ironically in Europe the straight double-edged one would probably be called the broadsword but anyway. Um, uh, it's sometimes known as a Chinese broadsword, sometimes known as a Chinese sabre. Is it a sabre? Yeah, kind of. Um, they are more or less curved. So, uh, and, oh, and also the term Dao more or less means a single-edged bladed item. The term is usually used, Dao, I understand, uh, I think in Mandarin, to refer to knives. But um, in the West, we usually, if someone says Dao, Chinese Dao, at least in sword circles, you normally know that they mean one of these. Now, the first thing to say is there are many, many types of Chinese Dao, and I, I'm absolutely not in this video at all going to attempt to talk about the many types of Chinese Dao that are out there. Um, they go back in date, and theoretically you could take them back to the Bronze Age in terms of single-edged swords in China. Um, but uh, there are types of Dao that range right away, you know, for the last few centuries. Um, and, and it wasn't simply a case of uh, the Dao, you know, one weapon going through an evolution and changing with time. If we look at various points in time, say for example in the 16th century, you would find there were certain different types of Dao in existence. Indeed, at the time of this um, sword being made in the 19th century, or maybe around 1900, there were at that time as well different types of Dao in existence. Um, without going into the, the Mandarin terminology, essentially they vary in size and vary in hilt length and also vary in width. So some Dao are narrower than this, some Dao are wider than this, some Dao have really deliberately two-handed length grips. Um, some, this I would incidentally call a one-handed length grip, although technically you could just about squeeze, it's almost like a hand and a half grip, you could almost squeeze two hands on there. Um, many Dao are shorter than this, this is actually a 29-inch uh, blade, and um, uh, many Dao are narrower than this. Now, there was a particularly famous type of ring-hilted um, Dao um, that was used in, in fact, even in the 20th century in the Second World War um, with a very, very broad blade, and that's a very particular weapon in itself. Um, I believe it's often called a, a, a dadao, I believe, which means big, uh, big knife or big sword. Um, but uh, most Dao, certainly in the 19th century, which is obviously when a lot of the weapons that I talk about come from, for the most part are single-handed weapons, sometimes with a longer hilt like this, but usually single-handed, and um, usually have a blade of approximately this type of shape, that being a single-edged um, front, a wedge section, that is it has a thick flat spine at the back um, and in cross section literally is wedge shaped like this, like a triangle and then usually with what in Europe would be known as a hatchet point. In actual fact this shape of point is very similar to a 1796 light cavalry sabre and we'll talk a little bit about the um, shape of the tip in a minute. Um, the, this particular example I would regard, amongst 19th century examples, whilst it's the first one I've owned, I've actually seen and handled many, many of them over the years that I've been collecting antique swords. Um, but as far as I have seen, this is a particularly large and heavy example. Most 19th century um, dowels that I have seen 
tend to have shorter blades than this. So this is 29 inches. Most of the ones I've seen are usually more about 26 inches and are usually lighter than this. This is a beefy weapon. This is comparable with a European falchion, um, a, a large falchion, in fact, something like the Cognes falchion. And the, the total weight of this is about 1,350 grams. That is about three pounds. Um, which is fairly heavy for a one-handed sword. It's not colossally heavy. Um, some medieval arming swords are up to about three pounds. Some of them are over three pounds. Um, but really, for the most part, if we're comparing with European swords, 1,300 grams very often is at the upper end of the one-handed sword weight range. Um, and indeed, you know, some European long swords are of that kind of weight. Some are heavier, some are lighter, but um, you do find long swords, which are of course much bigger swords, than, or longer swords at least than this, um, of, of that kind of weight. So it is, it's a fairly beefy weapon in just in terms of mass, but even more so um, it is a beefy weapon because of the point of balance. And I will show you, <laughs> it is there. Okay, now anybody who's watching this who knows a fair amount about swords or even knows a bit about swords will recognize that is a freaking long way from your hand okay and um, that uh let's just grab a tape measure that is from, uh, nearly eight inches from um from the guard so a balance point of eight inches from the guard that is further out than a um for example a 1796 light cavalry saber and in addition to that, the 1796 light cavalry saber is a lighter weapon this, than this by a considerable margin. This weighs three pounds. A 1796 light cavalry saber weighs only two pounds. That's two thirds the weight of this. Um, so one of the ways that the 1796 functions so well as a saber is that it is light, um, but having a point of balance far out. The combination of those two things means that you can move it quickly, but it still hits with a lot of authority. This, I cannot move anywhere near as quickly as a 1796 light cavalry saber. It is a really beefy, heavy weapon. And I would say, by and large, it is not a great quality weapon. Now, to touch on that, I believe this to date to um, the end of the 19th century and possibly the Boxer Rebellion. Now, the Boxer Rebellion, I won't go into the full history of it, but essentially a, um, a confederation of nations, including Britain, France, America, Prussia, uh, Japan, all banded together to go and fight China, essentially. Um, and um, it's politically, it's a uh, kind of in interesting and also bizarre and kind of horrible bit of history. But um, it was also a clash of cultures because the nations that went and fought in the, uh, the, the allied nations that went and fought in the Boxer Rebellion, so-called Boxer Rebellion, um, were essentially developed, um, industrialized, mechanized, as much as they could be in 1900, um, sort of, yeah, industrial nations. Um, Japan by that point was fully, you know, it had battleships, it had fought Russia, um, beat Russia incidentally, and, um, you know, obviously Europe and America were, were fully industrialized and, and had um, bolt action rifles and um, uh, machine guns, uh, Maxim machine guns and, and such like, and, and battleships and things like this, you know, modern, more or less modern battleships. Whereas, of course, China did have some, um, some relatively well-equipped and relatively well-trained um, forces, but they were small in number. And so a lot of the Chinese forces were made up of essentially um, levies of really badly equipped um, peasant or town levies with weapons like this. Um, so you do find that uh, lots of these kind of um, forced, uh, <laughs> drafted in, um, soldiers essentially weren't really soldiers um, were given a rubbish selection of weapons many of them using way out of date firearms and hand weapons like swords and spears and everything else glaives and such like um, so it's kind of interesting militarily because you see a clash of periods clash of technologies um, but the fact is that because the Chinese forces had to be equipped um, very quickly and in huge numbers, they churned out weapons at that time. And I believe that's what this probably is. It's probably a bring back. It's 
came from a, a British collection. It's probably been there for a, since, I would imagine, since no, about 1900, since the Boxer Rebellion. And um, it was probably a bring back from that campaign that some soldier brought back, or maybe even a civilian. Um, and it seems to date to that kind of period. Now it could be earlier, it could indeed be from some other part of the 19th century, but I don't think it's really, really old. In terms of the quality of manufacture, the blade is heavy and chunky, and um, without a shadow of a doubt, that shouldn't be taken as indicative of all Chinese Dao. Um, just like with European swords, or Japanese swords, or Indian swords, or Middle Eastern swords, whatever swords, there were a massive range of qualities the absolute best quality you can imagine at one end of the scale and the absolute cruddiest quality at the other end of the scale. And you know, this is, is something that which is often forget, forgotten when we're talking about different cultures and different nationalities and their weapons, is that within, you know, if we take Japan for example, Japan's famous for the quality of its swords, but if we look at 19th century for example, 19th century Japanese swords, you can find a vast range of qualities from, from mass-produced crap. I mean, the 20th century, they were literally producing them in factories for their NCOs for the Second World War, made of crap metal and they're absolutely, you know, they're absolute rubbish, except for, for their military interest. But as, as their quality of swords, a lot of them are rubbish. Um, right the way up to, obviously, some of the best swords that have ever been made by humans. So. Um, any culture, any nation is going to have a range of, uh, of qualities. This is not at the bottom end of the spectrum at all. It's a functional weapon. It's got, a, you know, it's a big old beefy tang. It's got a distal taper. It starts at about eight millimeters thick and it distally tapers down to maybe through two or three millimeters here. Um, it distally tapers in a similar fashion to a European saber. In fact, um, it's pretty much uh, tapering slightly down to that point and then it's much thinner in the what we would call the foible in the cutting portion of the blade um, and uh, but the but the guard and the pommel are quite rough now let's just talk about the the hilt for a minute so Chinese Dao seem to be relatively consistent now whilst whilst you consistent in terms of design while you do find obviously variations and different styles of pommel and different styles of guard they are nevertheless across a very broad period going right the way back into what you know what we would call the medieval period in Europe um, so going back hundreds of years you do find this basic setup and you also find a similar setup incidentally on, on Mongol swords as well which are undoubtedly related to Chinese Dao um, in their history um, first up is a disc guard Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about the guard in a second. Next, um, and this isn't always there, but in this case it is, an iron ferrule. That's to keep the wooden elements of the grip um, secure and prevent it from splitting and falling apart. A wooden core to the grip, and then with um, what remains on this one of a binding, if I just step out of the way for a second, a binding there whereby you can actually see the... Um, the sort of cord that's wrapped over the grip. And then finally, a pommel cap on the end here. And I have mentioned in a previous video, this is hollow um, and this peened at the end. So this is actually a cap. It's not a heavy weight. It does have mass to it and it does provide some degree of counterbalance, but fundamentally, it's not a counterbalance, it's a cap on the end. Um, and undoubtedly, if that was made solid, the point of balance wouldn't be out here, it would be back here, but the total weight of the weapon would be heavier. So pluses and minuses. The blade, as I mentioned, is a wedge section and it does have a thin fuller put in. In this case, the fuller is almost aesthetic. Um, it doesn't really do anything functional. It reduces a minimal amount of weight off the blade. You could make the blade lighter by making it slightly narrower or grinding it slightly differently. Um, really, that fuller is not really achieving much at all, which I find interesting in itself because the fact that the fuller isn't actually doing very much mechanical suggests that they put it there simply because they thought it should have a fuller in it and it looks better with a fuller, which it does. Um, <coughs> so it could just be that they, they, they went to that extra effort to make it look better. Now, in terms of the guard, I have spoken quite at length about sword guards in reference to different designs of sword in the past. Um, obviously in uh, medieval Europe the cross guard was predominant. Um, we see a similar thing on Indian swords with the quillons, it's quite similar to a, to a European cross hilted sword. Um, and 
Sabres obviously provide more hand protection than, than this kind of disc does. But what's interesting is that unlike with a European or an Indian sword hilt, where the cross goes in the same direction as the edge and the flat, the disc that we find on many Asian types of swords, including Chinese, Japanese, Korean swords, um, provides protection in every direction, which is a bonus. That's kind of nice. You know, if you look at it, it actually protects the back of my hand slightly, like a sabre guard does, and it protects the thumb slightly, like a sabre guard does. It doesn't protect front and back as much as a cross guard does, for example, on a medieval sword. And that's kind of interesting, and lots of people have surmised that this relates to the way that these swords were used. Personally, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Japan aside, most other countries that we're using, for example, if we look at the Mongols or we look at the Chinese, that we're using this type of discard, we're using the sword with a shield. If you're using the sword with a shield, actually hand protection isn't terribly important. That's the reason that Viking era swords don't have much hand protection, is because if you're using a large shield, you don't need it. And that's the thing to say is that in China, when the Dao was used, it would generally have either been used with a shield, or it would have been used as a backup weapon and the primary weapon would have been a gun, a bow or a spear or maybe a glaive, uh, a pole arm. So if it was a backup weapon then it might be used just by itself um, but if it was a primary weapon it would usually be used with a shield. Um, so what that says about the design of the guard I don't know. Um, why it's a disc, why we find a disc in, in China for example, but we find cross guards in many other parts of the world, don't know. Um, but there's some things to think about and maybe we'll discuss that a little bit more in a future video because there are some more things I could say about that. Um, and interestingly the disc guard usually, as this example does, has a turned up lip, which I hope you can kind of see there. Okay, so it's um, why is the lip turned up? I actually think there's a couple of reasons. So some people might think purely from a, a functional fighting point of view. They might think, oh, so that weapon tips will get sort of trapped in there. So if you're fighting someone who's thrusting at you and you guard, that the, the, the tip of the weapon might get stuck down there if they've got a spear or something like that. I don't think that that's the reason. I suspect that the reason is to make it more comfortable to wear. Um, because if you had a disc just with a thin, narrow edge, it would be constantly kind of digging into you. By having that turned over lip, it makes it far more comfortable to wear. And as I mentioned in many of my, my videos, swords spend the vast amount of their time being worn, not being used to fight with. Um, so there we go. Um, so I'm only really gonna, I'm gonna wrap up there. I, I'm gonna use this weapon in future videos. I am incidentally gonna sell this weapon as well. It will be on my website at some point. But um, really to say that DAOs, um, it, across the centuries, vary hugely. Um, there is a fairly good Wikipedia page, actually, um, on, on the DAO um, that gives a good overview. And it's very clear that the DAO as a term is quite a loose term. It means a single-edged sword, or it can mean a knife. Um, this is a comparable weapon, perhaps, to the Langmesser or the Falchion. Um, probably more similar to a falchion really, but in terms of making general statements about the Dao, we can't really because the Dao is such a broad catch-all term. It can be a two-handed weapon, it can be a one-handed weapon, it can be long, it can be short, it can be light, it can be heavy. This particular example is, I would argue, predominantly a one-handed weapon and heavy and at the middle to lower end of the quality spectrum and probably mass-produced for the uh, Boxer Rebellion. So it is the sort of weapon, the sort of sidearm, that a common soldier in China would have been given, uh, rather than purchased I would think, would have been given by the government to carry as a sidearm, probably in the late 19th century, perhaps early 20th century. Um, and it is a very particular type of large cleaver. Don't confuse it with a machete, it's heavier than a machete. It is more like European fashion. It is a great big cleaver. It is not a subtle weapon, it is not a small or light weapon. This is a big, beefy, heavy weapon. Would I want to fight with it? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't feel disastrous if I had to fight with it, but um, I would not personally, if I did have to fight with it, I'd want to have a shield as well. This is a big, clunky, heavy weapon, and you know, as you guys know, I've got lots of different swords in my collection, and in the grand scheme of things, comparing everything, 
Viking period swords through to Indian tulwars through to long swords and medieval arming swords and rapiers and save, Napoleonic Wars sabers and everything else. This, out of everything, is a kind of, whoa, that is a beefy, chunky, heavy one-handed sword. And um, it's definitely at the heavier and more unwieldy end of the spectrum of all the swords I've ever handled, actually. Uh, but nevertheless, an interesting piece. And the Chinese Tao is a, a, by itself a very complex and interesting subject and definitely worthy of some more future videos. Uh, hopefully I'll do a future video where I slap some pictures in because obviously I don't have access to lots and lots of Tao's so I'll try and show some uh, from other collections to give you a sense of the great variation on one hand that we see in Chinese Tao's um, and the different types but equally some of the unifying design features that we often see in the Chinese Tao, um, that being the disc guard, the pommel, the, the cord wrapped grip, and this kind of hatchet pointed um, blade. And I did also, just before I completely finish off, I did say I'd say a bit more about that hatchet blade. I think absolutely, like many Asian swords, this is optimized to cutting with the end of the blade. So despite the fact it's a 29 inch blade, the centre of percussion will be from here right the way up to the end and just like a katana or indeed like certain Filipino swords um, you will produce very effective cuts with the very end of the weapon here which you can't necessarily do with, um, with certain types of European sword which are narrower and lighter at the tip where you have to cut further down the blade. So actually the reach on this weapon is quite considerable. Right, I'm going to wrap it up there but I will, I'm sure, feature this sword in at least one more video before I sell it. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.